The title is You Can't Do It. Man is proud, full of pride. He thinks of himself more highly than he ought to. Sometimes it comes out in his boastful declarations. The Greeks said man is the measure of all things. Sometimes it comes out in his foolish attempts to do the impossible. Remember Genesis 11, they tried to build the tower to the very heavens. Or there is a modern quest for immortality. It seems every few years I read a story that says the first person to live forever has already been born. I haven't met that person. (laughs) On a societal level, man attempts systems that cut against his very nature. Think of socialist countries. Or every once in a while you'll read about these pay-what-you-want cafes that quickly go bankrupt because no one wants to pay anything. It's all an expression of man's hubris. I can defy the very nature of man. Sometimes man's pride hits a little closer to home. Just go back to the gym in your middle age and you will discover, even though you think you are 25, you are not 25 anymore. Man's pride is especially evident in his approach to God. Man proudly declares there is no God, despite the plain testimony from the world around him, despite the internal witness of his own conscience, Romans 1, 18 through 20. See, he declares there is no God while knowing that his declaration is false. But somehow man believes that by the power of his declaration, by the mere force of his will, he can bring this new reality into being. There is no God, he declares. That is the definition of hubris. Or man's pride manifests in the making of his own gods, the inventions of his own mind. It's all foolishness, of course, and he knows it. Isaiah 44, half of the wood he used for fire to roast his meat and warm himself, and the other half he worships and says, this is my God. However you get there, the idea of inventing your own God, making yourself the create the uh, creator of the creator, is breathtaking in its pride. Or think of the atheist who boldly declares, there is no God, and even if there is, then when I die, I will lecture him to his face and tell him how bad he is. The, the pride of it. You will not lecture him. You will shut your mouth. You will tremble and then your knee will bow and your tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father before he sends you to eternal hell. And it is not just the quote-unquote heathens who have such pride. Plenty of people manifest their pride towards God under the banner of Christianity. There are those who change the gospel claiming that there is new revelation where God says, There is no further revelation. There are those who try to meld Christianity with Judaism, such as the Judaizers who are uh, in view in the book of Galatians. Or the so-called, we have something called Messianic Judaism in our time. Yeah, there there is a Messianic Judaism. It's called Christianity. (laughs) There is the ritualism of the Orthodox or Roman Catholic churches saying, Jesus is not sufficient in himself. It's Jesus plus good works that saves, sacramentalism. And there are even those in the Reformed tradition who quietly leak back into a works-based salvation of morality or ritualism, even while espousing the correct doctrines of grace. Speaking the very word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit in our text this morning, St. Paul cuts them all down in Galatians 3.10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. We could say all who rely on anything but Jesus Christ and his person and work are under a curse. All, each and every, in whatever form it comes. Not merely Orthodox Jews, misled Muslims, blind Buddhists, or ignorant atheists. All, all who are under a curse who try to rely on themselves. If your idea of salvation depends in any part on your action, on your religious observance, you are cursed. 
It is a principle that almost all of us who are hearing it this morning will agree with, having been trained in the word. We know what the Bible says. But it is a principle that we can espouse with our lips, yet violate in our hearts and in our minds, living in self-deception. So we must be very careful to hear the word that the Spirit is speaking this morning, to remind ourselves of its truth, and to beware of our own tendency to drift back into self-righteousness and self-justification. We must say away with all self, away with all reliance on self. We are each the chief of sinners and totally depraved. We cannot rely on self in any way, but must trust in Jesus alone for our salvation, or we are under the curse that St. Paul speaks about. Hence the title, You Can't Do It. But the, you can't be good enough for God before you're saved or after. But I have good news. You don't have to do it. God sent one who was good enough, one who was perfect to take our place. God sent him in his great love and rich mercy, providing the way of salvation and restoration for us, not through us, but for us through Jesus Christ. So first, let's look at God's standard for man. God's standard for man is very simple, sinless perfection. God made man very good, Genesis 1, 31. God made man in his own image and likeness, male and female in his own image and likeness, Genesis 1, 27. God blessed them both, Genesis 1, 28. And God gave them everything they needed and more, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. He gave them food to eat. He gave them authority over the creation. He gave them purpose to work the garden and to care for it. He gave them directives to be fruitful and to multiply. So man had a perfect nature. Man had all the supplies he needed. And man had all the direction he needed to carry out his purpose in life. God also gave them law, Genesis 3, 3, rules by which they would know how to live. And he gave them the greatest gift of all, close fellowship with himself, close fellowship with God, as he would come in the garden, meet with them face to face, walk with them in the cool of the day, Genesis 3, verse 8. In other words, mankind had a perfect environment. He had total fulfillment, an understanding of the meaning of life and the ability to attain it at the same time. What was his purpose? The same as now, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The difference is they were able to do it perfectly in the garden. You can call it paradise, you can call it perfection, you can call it heaven, you can call it any other term you like, but what it was was life as it was meant to be. Man and woman and all creation living in perfect harmony under God and with God face to face. So this is the beginning environment that God created for mankind. Man could dwell in the literal and immediate presence of God without fear or without worry because man himself was perfect in holiness. It, 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 that may violate your Calvinist feelings deep in your heart, but it was true before the fall. He could dwell with God perfect in holiness as God himself was perfect in holiness. God's holiness is unchanging and uncompromising. It means God hasn't changed since that time of the garden. In fact, we know that a key aspect, a key part of God's nature is his holiness. When we think about God, holiness is one of the first things that comes to mind. You cannot boil God down to one characteristic. He is holiness and he is love and he is wrath and he is judgment and he is mercy. He's all those things at once. But holiness stands out as a critical part of God's nature. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is thrice holy, Isaiah 6, 3, Revelation 4, 8. God is pure. God is perfect. God is without sin, without error, without blemish of any kind. Due to God's holy perfection, he cannot and does not tolerate sin of any kind, regardless of its form or extent. Sin cannot be in the presence of God. It is not because God is too dainty to handle sin, or he runs away from it in horror, 
No, God is far too powerful for that. In the presence of God, sin is destroyed. God's perfect justice, his infinite wrath, and his holy love rise up to destroy sin in an inferno of cleansing fire should it try to draw near to him. Habakkuk 1.13 explains his eyes are too pure to look upon evil, but that doesn't mean that he looks away from the evil. No, his holy gaze itself destroys evil. It burns it up. Psalm 5 verse 4 tells us the wicked, the evildoers cannot dwell with him. Psalm 5 verse 5, the arrogant cannot stand in his presence. Psalm 5 verse 6, he destroys liars. He abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful. Or you may remember in Deuteronomy 23, 14, the desert dwelling Israelites are warned, your camp must be holy. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp. See, it's not there's no holiness, so God withdraws and hides from it. God is going to be there either way, but he will deal with the unholiness in the camp. Or remember the book of Joshua, chapter 7. Unbeknownst to Joshua, the elders and others, Achan had stolen the things devoted to God and then lied to cover it up. There was, in other words, sin in the camp. So God... Uh, who had departed to their great detriment and refused to return, he said, yeah, I'll return when you destroy the stolen items. And so God revealed Achan as the thief. Achan confessed or admitted to his sin, verse 20. And under God's command, what did they do? They destroyed the stolen item. They destroyed the sinning man. They destroyed his family and all his possessions. And verse 26 says, then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. So he withdrew from their camp, but all he withdrew was his presence to bless. And all that was left was his presence to judge and his presence to curse. Now we tire of teaching it, but we'll teach it again anyway. This is not just for Old Testament times. This is not the mean and angry God of the Old Testament. I told you already, he has not changed. He cannot change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's for our time as well. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That was God's attitude in the Old Testament. It's God's attitude in the New Testament. Or Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, verse 48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And our text this morning says the same. Cursed is everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law. It's Galatians 3.10, and it's quoting Deuteronomy 27.26. Not cursed is everyone who does not do some things written in the book of the law. Not cursed is everyone who does not do most of the things or have substantial compliance with the things of the law. No, cursed is everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law if They're relying on their own self-righteousness. See, 99% obedience, there's a simple term for that. It's called disobedience. God says so in his word. He is perfect and his standard for mankind is perfection. God sets the standard and God is the standard for he created us. God is just in setting his standard of perfection. Remember, I proved it to you before. He created us without sin. He created us in a perfect environment, He created mankind in an environment where he had not sinned, sin was not in the world, and he had everything he needed, including instructions for what to do and law for what not to do. I'm emphasizing this because we must understand and internalize this fact. If you're going to rely on yourself, then you have to meet God's standard of perfection, which you cannot do. It is critical and it is reality. And the challenge for us, particularly in the modern age, but it's true for mankind of all ages, we tend to drift into relativism. We tend to drift into lower standards. Society's cry in our day is do your best or no one is perfect. Therefore, it's okay to fail or not even try. They don't say the second part of that out loud, but that's what it means. Well, nobody's perfect. It means I have an excuse. I don't even have to try. 
Our society is awash in excuse. We are rich in participation trophies. That means award without achievement. There is now something, I have referenced it several times up here, but it shocks me every time. There is now something called graded for participation or graded for completion. That means you can turn the assignment in with all wrong answers and still get 100%. Now, as the child of a math teacher and principal, this blows my mind. But graded for participation, that means as long as you tried, you will get 100%. The whole world now seems to be graded on a curve, lowering and watering down all standards of achievement and even denying reality. We are lied to and told that reality is racist or sexist or whatever else, or a social construct of no objective truth or legitimacy. And so what we can do, we are, we are marinated in it, it's all around us, what we can do is begin to apply that same kind of unrealistic thinking to God. See, God must have a lower standard like me. We must push against the tide of relativism and low societal standards by embracing biblical truth, lest we be swept by the current down the broad way that leads to destruction. And the truth is this, God is perfect. God demands perfection God destroys sin. Even one sin merits, uh, earns us our infinite punishment. For one sin is rebellion against infinite God. It's an infinite evil. It's a challenge to God's godness. Now, you may want to grade on a curve, but God will not grade on a curve. He is perfectly just and always perfectly applies his perfect standard of perfection. That's God's standard. Second point, the problem with mankind. Well, the perfection of God is not a problem. It was there in the beginning. The problem is the imperfection of mankind. After all, God and man dwelt in the garden together with woman and all the creatures, and there was no problem at all. It was perfect. It was very good. And God has not changed since that time. And he cannot change and he does not change. Hebrews 13, verse 8. It's part of his nature. It's called immutability. But it means God is the same and always has been the same and always will be the same. So he was perfect. There was no problem. He dwelt with man and God hasn't changed. So this can lead you to only one conclusion. If there's no problem with God's perspective, perfection, and if God does not change, and yet now there is a problem, the conclusion is this, man changed. It's right there in Genesis 3, through a cascading series of failures and disobedience by the man and the woman, they believe the devil's lies, that they can rise up against God, that they can overthrow God, and in believing this, it leads to action. They directly violate the clear word of God to them. They violated the law of God. Do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Genesis 2, 16, 17, and 3, 3. Now again, we're prone to grade on a curve. So we might look at that and say, what's the big deal? They just ate a little piece of fruit. But it's not so much the act of eating the fruit of that tree that was inherently evil, but rather that God had declared in clear terms to them that they must not do it. In other words, it's wrong because God, the standard, said it was wrong. And the evil of violating God's word was exacerbated or compounded by two factors. First, that they did so out of distrust for God. See, God told them, it's no good, it's not good for you to eat of that tree. The devil said, it is good for you. It's desirable for gaining wisdom. You'll be like God. And they believed the devil over against God. Second compounding factor, they ate the fruit in open defiance of God. Knowing that God said don't, they did. In fact, they did it because he said not to do it. It was their way of saying, you can't tell me what to do. It was their way of saying, you are not God. It was their way of saying, there is no God in the sense of with the authority to tell me what to do. 
In other words, they were giving the middle finger to God. It was rebellion, open rebellion. I am mankind, hear me roar. As a result of his sin, man became a sinner. His previous perfection was lost. His nature was forever twisted. He was expelled from the garden, from the presence of God to bless. Genesis 3, 23 and 24. In other words, as a result of his sin, man was cursed. Genesis 3, 17. And now man's new sin, warped sin nature is passed down, not just from him, not just to the wife, but it's passed down to all his offspring. Every mere man ever born, including you and including me. Therefore, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Therefore, there is no one good enough, not even one. Romans, 14, or Romans 3, 10 through 12, and Psalm 14, 3. Because of man's sin, because of Adam's sin that twisted our nature, we cannot keep God's law with perfection. We all sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20, we can't do it. We are incapable. As an, as an inevitable result of these truths declared by God in his word, we have a serious problem. We are like Adam expelled from God's presence to bless by our sin nature and by our sinful actions. We are forever separated from God in a gulf that we cannot cross. It is impossible to reverse our imperfection by our actions. We're not capable of doing it due to the sin nature that is in us. We've described it before as trying to clean the mud off with muddy hands. All you do is make the bright white robes muddier. Therefore, all who try to earn God's presence, who try to enter it by their own righteousness, by their own adherence to his moral law, are doomed to fail, and they are cursed. None of the great and holy men of the Bible, greater than all of us, none of them were able to do it. Acts 15.10 calls the law a yoke that not even our fathers could bear. Abraham, friend of God, couldn't do it. Noah, a righteous man, couldn't do it. Job, blameless and upright, couldn't do it. Not Moses, the most humble, who met with God in the tent. He couldn't do it. Not David, a man after God's own heart. Not any prophet, not St. Peter, not St. Paul, not John the Baptist, nor any other man in all history could do it. All sin. None are able to keep the law of God perfectly always. That's what our text this morning is telling us. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse because you can't do it. You can't do it. I can't do it. Gandhi can't do it. Trump or Obama or whoever you like or dislike, they can't do it either. Sinners all. Justly cursed all doomed to eternal hell, banished from God's presence, for the wages of sin is death, eternal hell, Romans 6, 23. Now, that's not very cheery, but you have to know the bad news before you know the good news. And the good news is this, point number three, God's solution to man's problem. God is perfect and demands perfection, and you are not perfect, so you are justly subject to his judgment. But praise God, that's not the end of the story. For our just and holy God is also rich in mercy and full of great love for us. He could have left man in his doomed and damned condition, but he didn't. The God who demanded perfection supplied perfection. Jesus Christ, very God from the beginning, the second person of the Trinity, became man. He lived a life of perfection for as very God, he was untainted by our sin nature, so he could live a life of perfection that we cannot. <coughs> Jesus Christ was without sin, Hebrews 4, 15. Jesus Christ always did exactly what the Father commanded, John 14, 31. In every action, in every word that he spoke, in every thought that he thought, 
He was perfectly holy all the time from birth to death. All of us who rely on observing the law are under a curse because we can't do it. But he could do it and he did it. And in his humanity, he went as our representative to suffer the full wrath of God for us. And he drank it down to the last drop till it was finished, John 19, 30. So he went as a human representative for us, and yet in his divine capacity, he could take on the infinite sin. He died the death that we deserve for our sin. And he rose from the grave, for death could not keep a hold on him. Acts 2, 24. Now, I don't understand the mechanism for all this. But he drank it down to its last drops and said, anything else? And when the answer was no, he rose from the grave in triumph. In other words, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it in full. And having paid the full wages of death, He left death behind, and he returned to life as the conqueror of death. In God's ingenious design, we don't have to earn what we are incapable of earning. Instead, we receive what we are incapable of earning. We receive it as God's free gift, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We receive it by faith. And our text tells us that. It tells us that though we deserve eternal death, we can live eternal life. Not by my righteous actions, not by my observance of the law. That leads to curse. No, we can live by faith, Galatians 3, 12. By trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone to save. By abandoning any reliance on self-righteousness or self-actions and instead relying on Jesus Christ alone. Not on myself, not on my false God that I made up, not even on Jesus plus me, which is really Jesus plus minus. No, we rely on Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, on his person and on his work. Any attempt to mix anything else in, false God, self-justification, whatever, will only add imperfection to the perfect. It will only result in curse. It will only doom me to the eternal death and the eternal hell that I otherwise deserved. It cannot be earned. It cannot be earned in part. It must be received or not received. Never earned or acquired, received, and received only by faith. By confessing with my mouth, Jesus Lord, and believing in my heart that God raised him from the dead. That God raised him from the dead, not in some abstraction, not as some historical fact, although it is a historical fact. No, God raised him from the dead for me. God punished him on the cross for me. Not even for us, for me for my sin and for your sin and for the sin of all who will put their trust in him, Romans 10, 9 and 10. It can only be received by crying out, not look how good at me I am, not look at all the good things I did, not look at my obedience to the law, no, by crying out, have mercy on me, a sinner. Not give me the salvation that I paid for or earned, no, have mercy on me, a sinner. We are and must be set free from the impossible task of human perfection and instead recognize our imperfection, recognize our inability. Say, I can't do it. And then trust in the perfection of the one and the only perfect God man, Jesus Christ. Don't cheapen God's gift of eternal life by trying to buy it with your efforts. Don't degrade the precious blood of Jesus by trying to add to it. That is subtraction by addition. Don't taint the perfection of the bright white robe of the righteousness of Christ by trying to wash it whiter with your muddied hands of sin or by sewing on to the perfect white robes of Jesus the filthy rags of your own perceived righteousness. Don't do it. Simply receive it by faith. Live by faith in the Son of God. Point number four, the problem with Christians. 
Now, most of us here profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and will gladly agree that those unbelievers must trust in him alone for their salvation. That's what they need. We will just as heartily agree that those silly sacramentalists in so-called Orthodox or Roman Catholic churches or wherever else must eschew their, eschew their erroneous gospel of Jesus plus works. We'll all agree they have to get rid of it. And we'll all agree they need to be saved by grace alone through faith alone. And then we smugly smile to ourselves and knowingly shake our heads at others for their false gospel of merit and works-based salvation. We have news for you, those of you in Christ. You do it too. You trust in your own righteousness too. You rely on your own observance of the law too. And if you do, then this scripture is true of you. You too will be under a curse if you rely on observing the law. For you cannot obey the whole law of God any more than anyone else. You cannot live in holy perfection any more than anyone else. Ask yourself, who is this letter to the Galatians addressed to? It's not to the Jews in Galatia. It's not to the Catholics or to the Orthodox in Galatia. It's not to the unbelievers or the atheists in Galatia or the pagans in Galatia. It's to the churches in Galatia, to the Christians in Galatia, to the believers in Galatia. And St. Paul tells us who they are earlier in the letter. They are those who eagerly received and believed the true gospel of grace preached to them by none other than St. Paul, Galatians 1:11. They are those who knew that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 2, 16. They are those who had received the Holy Spirit by believing what they had heard, Galatians 3, 1 through 5. In other words, this letter warning against observing the law, this letter is written to Christians, tested and approved, Galatians 3, verse 4. They needed to be reminded, just like we need to be reminded, salvation is by faith alone. Because of our pride, because of our twisted nature, our tendency is towards self-reliance also, towards self-justification also, towards self-salvation also. Now, it's not true of everyone all the time, but it's true of almost all of us at some time or the other. We begin to think, I am better than somebody else, so I must deserve God's favor. This is one of those rare instances where both the premise and the conclusion are incorrect. I am better than somebody else, so I must deserve God's favor. We invent little distinctions between one another so that I can look down on that other person and say, well, God chose me, but he didn't choose you. He must have chosen me because I am good. I am better than the atheist. No, you are not. I am better than the legalist. No, you are not. I am better than the Muslim or the Hindu or the homosexual or the transgender. No, we are not. I am better than that recent convert, for I was born a citizen. It is not true. There is no difference, the Bible says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Now, we surely live differently now that we are in Christ. We surely live in joyful obedience to God, in progressive sanctification. We were surely washed and sanctified and justified by Jesus Christ, our Lord, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. So there is a difference, but it's not because I'm better. It's because God made me different. God made me able, and I'm able to obey him, even now, not fully and perfectly, but I am able to obey him out of a thankful heart. We have to remember, friends, we are not chosen because we are better. We are being made better than we were because God chose us, Ephesians 1, verse 4. And we must remember that to this day, we are still no more capable of earning our salvation now than we were before. We're no more capable of being able to merit our salvation by our perfect law keeping than we were before, which is to say, not at all. We are still 
sinners, every one of us. We are still a mix, simul justus et peccador, simultaneously justified and sinner. It is not that we are saved and sanctified and thus able to live a perfect life, to earn God's salvation. That is a summary of the Catholic and Orthodox error. That, that's what they think, that God saved me and made me able. It's not correct. No, it is saved and sanctified by grace alone, end of sentence. Saved by grace and still saved by grace every day. Made alive through faith and still living by faith every day. It is a real danger for us. Our lives bear more resemblance to the biblical order than most of the world that we see around us. And we can begin to think, that makes me good enough. It's not true. It is a real danger for those with many years in the church. It is a real danger for those born into Christian homes. We begin to think, I am better than everyone else because of me. Be careful, brothers and sisters, to remember every day that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and that we live by faith in Jesus Christ. Do not trust in your baptism. It's a means of grace, but it's not the means of your salvation. Do not trust in the years of your membership. Do not trust in your perfect score on the memory verses or in your position as an elder or a nursery worker or your anything else. Trust in Jesus alone. Rest in Jesus alone. And remember, the old nature is still in there, crouching at the door, ready to dominate you. It is crouching at the door, waiting for the opportune time, waiting to strike and to destroy you. And I have seen it 20, 30, 40 years walking with the Lord. And suddenly we begin to think, I made it. I have arrived. Whatever thing I thought that I needed to pass, I have passed, and I've now crossed the finish line. Then the old man comes out. The old woman comes out, fumbling away 10, 20, 30, 40 years of effort, 40 years of ministry, 40 years of sanctification and hard work, all thrown away in a short time. The old sins come out and strike you. Oh, I haven't looked at pornography in 20 years. I've conquered that problem. The day you think I've conquered that problem is the day you are in big trouble. It creeps out after years. See, you think that old sin, whatever it is, you think that old sin was dead, but it was not. You thought you're above it, but it was not. It looked dead, but it was just plain possum waiting for you to let your guard down so it could strike. It can be, it can rise up for any number of reasons. Sometimes the old sin is triggered by a sudden change or by fear of the unknown or by an unexpected trauma or trial. But most of the time, it's not those things. Most of the time, it is unleashed by my complacency, by me letting down my guard, by thinking I don't need to be vigilant and watchful anymore. By my, in other words, by my self-reliance and by my pride, by my thinking, I'm past all of that. The day that you rely on yourself is the day that you make a huge mess. This is especially true when it comes to our salvation. We must be very careful to trust in Jesus Christ only and to live by faith whether you were baptized last year or last century, it doesn't matter. You must rely on Jesus every day. You must live by faith and not by works every day. By all means, do the works, but don't rest in them. Don't trust in them. Live by faith. If you begin to trust in your own observance of God's moral law and your own merit, you are in big trouble. So you're going back to the old way. You're going back to the way of the law. And that's okay, you can do this option that's available for you. You will fail in it, but that option is available for you. All you have to do is be perfect all the time in thought, word, and deed for the rest of your life until you die. It's impossible. 
You are putting on a yoke no one can bear. You can't do it. You will fail and you will fall. You will find yourself attempting the impossible. It will not work and you will drive yourself crazy in the effort. So I say this, don't do it. Sail into the safe harbor of eternal heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. Sailing ahead by the wind of his grace. Don't try to row yourself, row your boat in on your own strength. Instead, let the winds of grace, the winds of trusting in Jesus, blow you safely into that harbor. Or you'll find yourself rowing the boat on the winds and the waves, and the tide will take you adrift and off course. You don't have the strength to do it. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are a new creation and we will live a new life, but never forget that that new life is lived by faith and not by works. We are justified by faith and not by works. Let us all be careful to remember to live by faith and not to subtly drift into the idea of merit, into the idea of self-justification. If we trust in ourselves, we know deep down we can't do it. If we trust in ourselves, it's a path to anxiety. It's a path to misery. It's a path to uncertainty. But if we are trusting in Jesus Christ every day, that is a path to assurance. We can experience the the assurance. Not because I know that I'm great and I'm doing the job, but I know Jesus is great and he did the job. Past tense. Let us experience the assurance that can be ours in Jesus Christ. Let us experience the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. And let us experience the love of God that is for us in Christ Jesus. And God came and said, you can't do it, but I'll do it for you. And I'll make it available to you by faith because I love you. Experience that. Live by faith in Jesus above and trust and abide in his great love. Amen. Lord, we pray that we would never forget this truth, that we are saved by grace, that we can't do it, but you did it for us because you loved us. Let us live by faith. Let us live by grace and let us give you all the glory and praise celebrating that I don't have to trust in myself. I trust in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for me. And may we experience that joy and spread it to others. In Jesus' name, amen.